Hi friends! Today's storybook has a Ferris wheel theme. So today's Ferris wheel day and we have an activity to go with the book Mr. Ferris and his wheel. All right, today's activity is to build your own Ferris wheel. We are going to go through these directions more after reading the book. But if you wanted to get a little bit of a head start, you can take a peek at how to do that. Again, I will go over these directions after we read the story. Mr. Ferris and His Wheel, written by Katherine Gibbs Davis, illustrated by Gilbert Ford. It was only 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, Francis Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high that visitors to the top could see Paris in one breathtaking sweep. Now it was America's turn to impress the world at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. But what could outshine the famous French tower and who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Contest drawings poured in from around the country, but most of the plans looked like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one. Was it really the best that American engineers could muster? To an ambitious young mechanical engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. had already designed some of the country's biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He could never allow a French tower to overshadow America's World's Fair. Why hadn't the United States built the world's first skyscraper? George had seen the excellent steel frame rise 10 stories high with his own eyes. George had an idea, an idea for a structure that would dazzle and move, not just stand still like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Grinot, measured and remeasured. A mistake of even an inch could bring their invention crashing down. George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief of the fair. The chief stared at George's drawings. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge and complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawings and said, You are an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. The judges could not decide. Fall turned to winter as they dilly-dallied in only four months. The fair would open, and it still had no star attraction. Finally, desperate, they agreed to give George's far-fetched idea a try. But they would not give him one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank, asking for help. But when he began describing his invention, lenders laughed him into the street. So George used his own savings and convinced a few wealthy investors to join him. Still short of money, he boldly went ahead and ordered the parts he needed from a dozen different steel mills. In January 1893, George's construction crew began work on the foundation. Shovels broke as the workers tried digging into the frozen ground. It was one of the most brutally cold winters in Chicago history. 
blast. George ordered his crew to dynamite the icy earth, but what they found underneath was scarier still. Quicksand, the deadly muck could suck man or machine under in seconds. George and his brave workers kept frantically digging. Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They planted two huge steel towers deep into the earth, bolted them to crossbars of steel, and poured in cement to hold it all in place. Then they carefully lowered a 70-ton axle with fittings, the weight of a mogul locomotive train, between them. This sturdy structure would hold the gigantic invention steady and even strongest Chicago winds. As time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged into the fairgrounds loaded with more than 100,000 parts. Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego toy. Hammers pounded nonstop in the breathless race to finish. Responsible for the wheel's many structural details, George's partner was losing hope. It's undignified. Stand back, dear, it might collapse. Bet you the wind will blow Ferris's folly into the lake. Nope, it'll fall first. It's going up way too fast. They say Ferris has wheels in his head. Finally, with only two months left, the last section was bolted into place. And there stood a perfect, enormous circle, 134 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground and, de and designed to move with the precision of the smallest watch. It looked exactly how George had first imagined, back as a boy on his ranch in Nevada. Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin, and George's elegant passenger car still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a living room with enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. On June 21st, 1893, opening day finally arrived. 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and dedicated his wheel to the noble profession of engineering. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful, golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their nervous but excited guests. Uniformed guards closed and locked the door. Would the wheel work? George blew on the golden whistle. Two thousand tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine. Up, 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 the car quietly floated above the mud and noise. As the car was lifted higher, everyone rose from the velvet seats and crowded to the windows. Spread out below them was a dizzying sweep of the fairgrounds, the city of Chicago, and sparkling Lake Michigan, and even glimpses of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whisper soft stop. When the conductor called, All out! Everyone begged to go around again. The wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the city of Chicago, and across the country. 
All summer, visitors from around the world traveled to the Chicago World's Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy, or a girl. Everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couples asked to get married on it. On hot, steamy days, the wheel was the perfect place to escape up, up, up into the cooling breezes. All you needed was 50 cents. At night, George's Ferris wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs, another brand new invention. As the queen of the midway made its stately rotation, so did the seasons. Soon, a fall chill filled the air, and fair visitors began to thin out. On October 26, 1893, just before midnight, the immense, twinkling, spinning circle slowed to its final stop. The Chicago World's Fair was over. George had called his creation a monster wheel, but his investors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on one still feels like flying to the moon. And oh, 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 the view. All right, that was the end of our story. Now your challenge is to build your own Ferris wheel. All right, engineers, here's your directions. First, watch the video, which you have already done. Next, design and build a Ferris wheel that rotates on an axle. Here's how you do that. Find an object in your house that has a small hole in the middle. Find materials you can use to suspend the object off the ground. And then make it spin. Here are some materials that you might want to think about. A spool of ribbon, a spool of thread, anything with a small hole in the middle. Possible materials for the poles. Straws, popsicle sticks, and pencils. All right, friends, I hope you have a really fun time making your own Ferris wheel and being little engineers yourself. I will see you next time for our next activity and story. Bye.